Welcome to Church at Home. We are so excited that you have joined us today. Hey, I think we can finally say it's summertime. So good. To all the students out there who have finished their school year, well done. And to those students who still have a couple of days left, we're almost there. Today we have a wonderful gathering to be able to join together in. In a few moments, Ricky and Rebecca are gonna come and celebrate our graduates. Michelle's gonna lead us in worship and Kirsten is going to speak our message today. But first, we want to celebrate the generosity of Living Waters. This week, we've been able to send finances to some really wonderful people. Here at Living Waters, we have something called Global Partners. That, those people are those who uh, are part of our community but are involved in full-time ministry and have to support Rays to be able to do that ministry. And so we as a community are able to stand behind them and say, we love what you are doing. And so you can see their names uh, here on the screen and we can celebrate the ministry that they're doing to athletes, to those who are incarcerated, to uh, providing relief to those around the globe. What wonderful ministries that they are doing. And so we've been able to support them as a community. So if you want more information about them, you can email me, my information is on the website, and I would love to connect you with them as they continue to do ministry. Living Waters, let's worship together and let's celebrate a wonderful day together. Friends, Romans 12 tells us that we need to party with those who are gonna party or at least that's my personal translation of the passage. And if anybody deserves a party this year, it's graduates. If you're graduating from high school or a diploma program in underwater basket weaving or university or whatever, we want to party with you. We are so proud of you. Really, anybody involved in education in this past year, it has not been easy. Way to go, way to pull through. And friends, as a community, we want to remember the people that need us to celebrate with them, especially when it's so difficult to celebrate this year. So if you know someone who's graduating or graduated, find them, throw a party for them in some way, celebrate them. And today, we're going to listen to a couple grads about what their experience over the last year has been, what graduating means to them, and how God has been present to them. I encourage you to, to listen, and as you listen, to think of those in your life who need you to reach out and party with them. So I'm Enzo Passerini. Uh, I'm graduating from Ari Mountain uh, Secondary School here in Langley, and I'm going to, into UBC for political sciences. For me, graduation is sort of a rite of passage into adulthood. Um, it's also can be a sign of maturity, right? It's just, it's a big ending to the chapter of your life, which is school, you know, we've been studying for over a decade, um, which is why I think it's so disappointing that it's underwhelming this year because of COVID, because it's supposed to be such a big celebration of who you are and how you've grown in the last, you know, 12 years of studying. I think that God was sort of like a light at the end of the tunnel for me. Um, you know, coming back to youth when it restarted, that was like, you know, having something to look forward to every week. And it was different. It made things different for a while, you know. Um, we were used to just not having any events or anything to look forward to in the week. So youth and church and that type of stuff was just something, you know, I knew was gonna happen. So I knew there was something to look forward to every single week and a group of people that I could go and hang out with and have a bunch of fun with and actually interact with other people instead of just being, you know, home uh, or at school where there's not much of that interaction anymore. So it was definitely important, uh, I think, for a lot of the students mentally, it was very important because you actually got to talk to other people and just physically got to leave the house. You had something to actually go to. My name is Emily Gertzen, and I graduated from Trinity Western with a bachelor's degree in nursing. Graduation means that I can start my career as a nurse, and it means that like I move into greater responsibilities and just have more freedom to explore the opportunities that come with graduation and um, make decisions for my life. And yeah, that I'm done with all of assignments, exams, and kind of like constrained to that school schedule. So I'm pretty excited to just like move into a new phase of life. I felt excited and also like quite nervous. <laughs> 
just because there's so much more expectations that come from being a student nurse than like a registered nurse. And there's like a bit of safety that you feel like being a nurse or a student nurse because you're not expected to know everything or like have the same amount of um, skill as someone who is like a full nurse. This season comes with a lot of like unknowns and unpredictability that I've been used to with school. And so I think God has just been able to give me peace, even though it's like new and scary sometimes, but I've just felt God um, be with me just with the support that I've gotten and um, just people ahead of me to like encourage me and give me advice and support me in that way. And I've also just been provided a really good job to start with that feels natural and um, suited towards me and like a really good workplace, so yeah. This last Tuesday, we got to celebrate our graduates in style. I'm talking gowns, suits, I even wore high heels. Near the end of the evening, our grads got to see videos of their friends, their family, and youth leaders, all sharing words of encouragement and congratulations. And in that moment, I was reminded that they would not have made it through without the support and love of their community. It takes a village. I wanna encourage us, their church family, to pray for our students in high school and in university and college. And if there's a stirring in your heart to get involved, please don't ignore it. We need people of all ages who love Jesus and are passionate about reaching this next generation. We are so proud of our graduates. Would you now join me in praying for them as they enter this next season of their life. Gracious Father, thank you so much for your presence in our lives. Lord, I specifically am thankful, Lord, for your presence, your close and constant presence in the lives of our graduates. This wasn't an easy season, yet you brought them through. Lord, I pray that each of our graduates would continue to lean into you, that they would allow your Holy Spirit to lead and guide them as they enter into this next season of their life. Father, I thank you that you've already made a way for them. They don't have to make up their future, Lord. They just have to discover it. And so we just thank you so much that you care and that you are present and that you are walking alongside of them. Thank you, Lord, for all of our graduates. I pray a blessing over their lives and over their future. In your precious name, amen. Welcome, please join us in worship. Awake my soul and sing, sing his praise aloud, sing his praise aloud.
Good morning. I'm Marsha Wilson, and today I'm reading from 1 Corinthians 15, 3 to 8, and then verses 12 to 26. I passed on to you what was most important and what had also been passed on to me. Christ died for our sins, just as the scriptures said. He was buried and he was raised from the dead on the third day, just as the scriptures said. He was seen by Peter and then by the 12. And after that, he was seen by more than 500 of his followers, all at one time, most of whom are still alive, though some have died. Then he was seen by James and later by all of the apostles. Last of all, as though I had been born at the wrong time, I also saw him. But tell me this, since we preach that Christ rose from the dead, why are some of you saying that there will be no resurrection of the dead? For if there is no resurrection of the dead, then Christ has not been raised either. And if Christ has not been raised, then all our preaching is useless and your faith is useless. And we apostles would all be lying about God. For we have said that God raised Christ from the grave, but that can't be true if there's no resurrection of the dead. And if there's no resurrection of the dead, then Christ cannot be raised. And if Christ has not been raised, then your faith is useless and you are still guilty of your sins. In that case, all who have died believing in Christ are lost. And if our hope in Christ is only for this life, we are more to be pitied than anyone in the world. But in fact, Christ has been raised from the dead. He is the first of a great harvest of all who have died. So you see, just as death came into the world through a man, now the resurrection from the dead has begun through another man. Just as everyone dies because we all belong to Adam, everyone who belongs to Christ will be given new life. But there's an order to this resurrection. Christ was raised as the first of the harvest. Then all who belong to Christ will be raised when he comes back. After that, the end will come, when he will turn the kingdom over to God the Father, having destroyed every ruler and authority and power. For Christ must reign until he humbles all the enemies beneath his feet. And the last enemy to be destroyed is death. It's good to be with you today. If we haven't met, my name is Kirsten, and I'm one of the pastors here at Living Waters. We are in our final two weeks of our Essential series. And our final topic of exploration is the Christian view of the future. I'm gonna to focus today on our future as believers and how that shapes and fuels our lives in the present. Next week, Ricky is going to share more broadly on the future of creation and our world. Ricky actually started our series off by sharing about creation months ago. So there's some really beautiful symmetry about him finishing our series next week. Do you like to know how a story ends? I do. I'm actually sometimes guilty of skipping ahead to read the end of a novel if the suspense is really killing me. Or I'll kind of flip ahead a couple hundred pages to see if a character is still alive that I really like. I think that we, as people, have an innate curiosity about the future, maybe even a hunger or a need to know. Are we, in the end, we want to know, living in a comedy or a tragedy? Are the cynics right, or did the dreamers have a better grasp on reality than we knew? As we look to the Bible to learn what God says about the future, we might be hungry for details. We might be wishing for something kind of like a schedule, that tells us the specifics of when and how. We don't, however, get that many details. Instead, we get a lot of images and metaphors that can be difficult to interpret and understand. There's a certain mystery about them. The New Testament authors don't actually focus much on detailed questions about the future. 
They do, however, have a deep joy and confidence about what's going to happen. Their view of it fuels their present. It's the river of life-giving water that fills them and enables them to be faithful. It isn't the details, though, or dates and times that give them joy. It's the reality of a risen Lord, a king, victorious over death. Their understanding of the future is grounded in what happened on Easter morning when Christ rose from the dead. And so is ours. The resurrection is the lifeblood of the New Testament. Every part of it sings with the reality that because Jesus was victorious over death, our future is a victorious one. Let me share a story with you from World War II. If you read up on the Allied forces in World War II, you will likely learn about two important dates. The first of these dates is called D-Day, and it happened on June 6, 1944. This was the day Allied forces were finally able to invade Northern France through successfully landing troops on the beaches of Normandy, France. It is identified as the turning point of the war, that strategic moment in which the ultimate victory of the Allies was secured. Before this point, it often seemed like the Nazis would win. After D-Day, however, even though battles still raged on and many people died, the Allies were confident. It's only a matter of time now, people would say. Victory in Europe Day, or V-Day for short, was over a year later on May 8, 1945. This was the day in which the Allies formally accepted Germany's unconditional surrender of its armed forces, which officially ended the war. So why the history lesson? The resurrection of Jesus is the decisive moment in which our future was secured. It was the moment in which the battle was, for all intents and purposes, won. It was our D-Day. And we are able to say, with much greater confidence than the Allies were, that it is only a matter of time. And V-Day? V-Day is that final day that we are looking forward to, when Jesus will return as a reigning king, to judge the world and make things right. We, right now, are living in that difficult, gritty, but hopeful time between D-Day and V-Day. More people, incidentally, died in that final year of World War II than in all the other years before. Some of the fiercest fighting in the whole war happened in that final year. And the war certainly wasn't over. But people fought with the confidence that they were going to win. And so do we. You might have noticed that the passage Marcia read for us a few minutes ago was all about the resurrection. I want us today to look backward at our D-Day so that we can understand the ultimate victory that we are waiting for, fighting for. It's critical that we do this because only when we have this hope firmly in our hearts will we be able to be faithful in the here and now. It's this hope that helps us to endure and that gives us a joy that no circumstance can touch. So let's look backwards so we can look forwards with eyes focused on our central hope. What do we learn about our future when we look at the resurrection of Jesus? Well, first, we learn that Jesus' resurrection means that he will return as a reigning king who will fully fulfill his kingdom. If you listen to Jesus' teaching, he talks all the time about something called the kingdom of God. He says that he needs to tell the good news of the kingdom. He talks about how to enter the kingdom. And when he tells parables, his stories with a point, they usually begin with, the kingdom of God is like. 
The kingdom of God is also something that the Old Testament prophets describe long before the time of Jesus. In Isaiah 11, for example, we are given a beautiful picture of the kingdom that the Messiah is coming to bring. It speaks of justice being given to the poor and of the wicked being destroyed. The chapter describes the land where he lives as being a glorious place. And it describes a world of peace or of shalom. The Jewish word for peace that means so much more than the absence of conflict, but of things being made right, things being made whole. Nothing will hurt or destroy in all my holy mountain, Isaiah says. For as the waters fill the sea, so the earth will be filled with people who know the Lord. This is the new kingdom that Jesus came to bring. It's a time when people are reconciled to one another and to God. It's a time when people finally have the capacity to treat creation and one another rightly. And at the center of all the, these images is Jesus, the reigning king. Acts 1 does such a great job of describing when Jesus leaves the earth and goes up to heaven. The disciples are standing there, straining their eyes to see him for as long as possible. And suddenly there are angels present who say, men of Galilee, why are you standing here staring into heaven? Jesus has been taken from you into heaven, but someday he will return from heaven in the same way you saw him go. We've been waiting for him ever since. We're waiting for him to come and judge the world, to finally make things right. All the goodness, healing, and reconciliation of the kingdom of God will come because we finally have the right leader, both ultimately powerful and ultimately loving and good. Our culture approaches our leaders with a healthy dose of cynicism. We question our authority figures and are more suspicious than hopeful about our politicians. We are constantly deconstructing our heroes, discovering that they were only human after all. But all you have to do is look at the stories we tell to see that we are still longing for someone to believe in. And we look back at people like Winston Churchill, Mother Teresa, Martin Luther King Jr. All of them flawed human beings. But in their moments, each showed us a glimpse of the kind of leader we're longing to follow. Who are your heroes? We are longing for a true king, for someone trustworthy who will not let us down. We are longing for one who will lead us as no one ever has. Jesus is that king, that true king that every good human leader has given us a glimpse of. And because of his resurrection, we can be confident of this. The good guy wins. He wins. He is returning as a reigning king. Verse 24 and 25 of our text today tell us that the end will come when Jesus will turn the kingdom over to God the Father, having destroyed every ruler and authority and power. For Christ must reign until he humbles all his enemies under his feet. Those of us who have given our lives to Jesus get to live in the confident hope that no matter how dark or broken things seem in our world, we have chosen the winning side. Right now, in this time between D-Day and V-Day, the kingdom is breaking in. That's what we as the church are all about. We are about ushering in God's kingdom through the transformation of societal structures, through being reconciled to one another, through creating community that gives people a taste of the kingdom, through allowing the Holy Spirit to change our hearts. Every way that God is at work in the world is the kingdom of God invading our broken world. But right now, that invasion isn't complete. We are looking forward to a future where the kingdom of God will finally all be now, when everything will be made right. 
think of what we have been wrestling with the last month with indigenous peoples. Um, Dave is going to come and pray a prayer of reconciliation in honor of um, Indigenous Peoples Month um, in just a little bit. We think about the ache of stories like what happened in our residential schools. Imagine that being completely healed. That's, that's what we're waiting for. That's what Jesus' resurrection means. It also means that Jesus' resurrection means that we will also be resurrected. Our text in 1 Corinthians 15 was written in response to believers in Corinth who were teaching that there was no physical resurrection of believers after death. Paul begins by explaining that Jesus died for our sins, was buried, and was raised on the third day. He lists all the witnesses who encountered Jesus after the resurrection, Peter and the other disciples, over 500 followers at one time, James, all the apostles, and finally, Paul. And then he considers what it would have meant if this, these believers in Corinth were right and there were no resurrection of the dead. If that were the case, Paul insists, then Jesus isn't raised and our faith is useless we are still left with the guilt of our sins. Paul ends this what if section by declaring, if our hope in Christ is only for this life, we are more to be pitied than anyone in the world. But, Paul asserts, Christ has in fact been raised from the dead. He is the first of a great harvest of all who have died. For Paul and for the rest of the eyewitnesses to the resurrection, what Jesus is after the resurrection is a glimpse of what we will become. He is, as Paul says, the first of a great harvest. Death might have come through one man, Adam, but the resurrection from the dead has come through another man, through Jesus. It seems to me that when we think about our future, our physical bodily resurrection is not something we talk about much. Our view of the future tends to focus more on being in heaven with Jesus. We do know that, as Paul says, to be away from the body is to be at home with God. But the central hope of the New Testament is that when Jesus returns, we will experience resurrection and be given new physical bodies. So what does this mean for us? Well, for one, it means that the future we're looking forward to is tangible. The future life we're looking forward to is not a disembodied life. Jesus is at this very moment still human and sitting at the right hand of the Father, and we will be like him. When Jesus was with the disciples in his new resurrection body, he was solid and real. He cooked breakfast. He ate fish. He let the doubting disciple Thomas touch his wounds. Our future life is an embodied life. And it's a life with bodies that are suited to live in God's new heaven and new earth. In verse 50 of our text for this week, Paul explains that our physical bodies can't inherit the kingdom of God, not the full kingdom because these dying bodies cannot inherit what will last forever. So we need new ones, and our new bodies will not decay or die. And after the resurrection, Jesus occasionally does something he wasn't able to do before, like disappear. I'm not quite sure what that's about, but I'm looking forward to finding out. Stop and think for a moment what it really means that we will have bodies that finally work the way they should, that do not die. I have a dear friend who has lived her entire life in a wheelchair. I can't tell you how important this hope is for her. It matters to her so much that sometimes I think it's painful to hope for it. Her longings and the longings of everyone with cancer or chronic pain or fibromyalgia or mental illness, or cerebral palsy, or multiple sclerosis, will be met. 
It's so important for us to remember that our future we hope for is a life when we will not be disembodied spirits, but when we will finally be fully and wholly human, as we were always meant to be. And this means that we will be more fully who we are than we're able to be now. We'll be who we were meant to be. I think it's difficult for the storytellers in our world to get a picture of our future right. And how could they? It's difficult to get something right that we can barely understand. I have seen movies where the picture of a future life with God is disembodied and bland, with all the grit and passion of emotion gone. This is actually more Buddhist than it is Christian. In Buddhism, one of the central goals is to escape from passion because this was part of Buddhist solution to the problem of suffering. What we are invited into is the exact opposite of this. C.S. Lewis puts it this way. It would seem that our Lord finds our desires not too strong, but too weak. We are half-hearted creatures fooling about with drink and sex and ambition when infinite joy is offered us. Like ignorant children, like an ignorant child who wants to go on making mud pies in a slum because he cannot imagine what is meant by the offer of a holiday at the sea. We are far too easily pleased. We are looking forward to the full, abundant life that Jesus came to bring us, lived out in a new heaven and a new earth. Finally, Jesus' resurrection means that death is a beaten enemy. We learn in 1 Corinthians 15 that all enemies are going to be under the authority of Jesus and that the last enemy to be destroyed is death itself. This is the end of death in all its forms. Physical death, yes, but also evil, sin, selfishness, apathy, numbness, entropy, decay. I don't think we can fully understand what this means because our entire experience of life is interwoven with death. Anyone in our world who can't face the reality of suffering and death is someone who doesn't really understand what it means to be human. They don't really have a grasp on reality. They're in denial. And in this world, it is often pain and suffering, or even our own wrongdoing, that God himself uses to deepen us as people. But this is what I know. God uses death, but he has never been reconciled to it. It has destroyed so many of his children. It has ruined relationships. It has dehumanized and sucked the life out of the world. When God made the world and humanity, he made it good. That is our birthright, to be human with no taint of death. And Christ has won that back for us. Death has been and always will be the ultimate enemy. The greatest message of the cross and resurrection is that death itself does not have the last word. You know, if you look at church history and even in the world today, the people pressing into the Christian hope are those whose life is hard. Slaves, the poor, the marginalized. Read some of the lyrics of the black spirituals birthed within the hearts of slaves. Their hope gave them endurance. It kept their souls from being crushed. I have felt in the difficulty of the past year that there are things Jesus can only teach us in the midst of suffering. This, I believe, is one of those things, to dig down deep into our hope for the future, to let our hearts root in the soil of a future with resurrection bodies, where Jesus draws near to us and is established as king, and where death is vanquished forever. This is what enables us to live faithful lives now, being able to say, it's only a matter of time now. Jesus told his disciples, here on earth, you will have many trials and sorrows, but take heart because I have overcome the world. Our deepest longings are pointing to our future with Jesus, 
our longing for a home we have never been to, a home that we catch glimpses of from time to time, but which we have never fully seen, our longing to be fully known and loved in a way that we catch glimpses of in our earthly relationships, our longing to be fully present and joyful and alive, to be able to fully engage in play, to be able to experience life fully, our longing to no longer have to grieve over pain and loss, sickness and death. All these longings and more are met in our future with Jesus. It's worth thinking about. It's worth yearning for. Okay.
The theme of future has been intertwined through this entire service. Uh, the future of our global partners, the future of our grads, as we've sung songs that point us forward and of course the hopeful teaching from Kirsten. It seems like there's so much to sort out when we think about the future of our lives, our families, our community, our country. Let's be reminded today that God is with us past, present, and future. And he speaks of this in Jeremiah chapter 29, verse 11, where he promises, I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to, that are good, they're not for disaster. The future. To understand the future, we often have to go back to see how we got to where we are. The entire month of June is National Indigenous History Month. This is uh, certainly important to us as a family as we continue to explore the Ojibwe culture, the language and the culture, as this is part of my wife, Julie's ancestry. I know we all carry in our hearts today a tremendous amount of sadness for the events of the last few weeks because of what happened in Kamloops. We have posted on our church webpage a story, the story of Pastor Bruce Brown. This has been provided to us by our denominational district office. This 10-minute story, this 10-minute honest story, is of Pastor Bruce Brown and his wife Adeline. Both are residential school survivors from Haida Village in Haida Gwaii. I worked closely with Bruce when I served in my previous role. Such a good man. Over the course of his uh, service, he's been an elected elder, a pilot, and is now pastoring in Vancouver at Native Pentecostal Church. And he's being used across our province and our country as he shares his story and he participates in wholesome good conversation. In this video, in this story, Pastor Brown tells his particular story he speaks about the future, and he offers a very heartful prayer at the end of the video. And I encourage you to find uh, that story on our webpage, specifically on our news page. This Sunday, we want to join churches across our province in prayer. Allow me to lead us in five prayerful statements, and I would encourage you uh, to join with me in the collective reading of the verses that will be on the screen as I lead this. So let's pray together. God, we, we pray that you would forgive the evidence of sin within our lives and community. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. God, we pray for healing within the lives of residential school survivors and their families from the generational trauma that they have suffered from the residential school system. He heals the brokenhearted, binds up their wounds. God, we pray for healing of broken relationships between churches and First Nation leaders. Be kind and compassionate to one another forgiving each other, just as in Christ, God forgave you. And God, we pray for emergence of young indigenous leaders to become leaders and good role models in their respective communities. Set an example for the believers in speech and conduct in love and faith and in purity. And finally, we pray for the establishment of new life-giving disciple-making communities across our nation that will lead the way in reconciliation and revival. For God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ, not counting people's sins against them, and he committed to us the message of reconciliation. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. The future, so where do we go from here? Perhaps one small call to action would be joining us during our Grow Series on June 30th in person in our Fort Langley Auditorium 
as we continue in a dialogue with Luke Dan Durant, a conversation called We Are Kwantlen. Just before we go, uh, let me remind you of a few, uh, one community announcement, and that relates to Sunday worship. It begins in just a couple weeks at 5.30 and at seven o'clock, during that time, our kids will be served in the park adjacent to our Fort Langley location. You need to sign up to reserve your spot. It'll be an evening of teaching, of scripture reading, of prayer and worship. It's gonna be wonderful to be in person together. We so look forward to seeing you on July the 4th. So friends, have a good week. Thank you for joining us during Church at Home. God richly bless you.